gotta love that tree frog urine all over my hand. Where are you going, dude? Our lives used to look like this. For years, we got to travel the world, touring with the band I was in. At the same time, we raised chickens and gardened at home in Nashville. Then we changed everything and moved to my hometown to start a little farm by the beach. Now our lives look more like this. We're still learning this farmy lifestyle one sweaty mess at a time, and we're inviting you to learn with us. I'm Nina. And I'm Brendan. And this is Farm to Table. Making a place intentionally for other people besides yourself is really remarkable and it's so, honestly it's really counter-cultural now. Like a big table out front says, it's not about us to be able to deliberately set about designing a home life that says we want other people here is unbelievably refreshing. When Elias was here the other day, he had never been here before because he lives a few hours away. He said, I've never been to any house with more tables. You guys have a table in your garden, you have a table on your porch, you have three tables in the barn, a table in your house, a table in your kitchen. Oh, that's actually really interesting. Designing gardens is my job, and sometimes they're just the raised beds, but my favorite ones usually have kind of a gathering space in the middle. The heart of it is a table or a fire pit or something like that. I love having places where people can gather, even if it's not eating a meal, really, just to hang out, just to do life, have conversations. Um, I'm comfortable at a table. Mostly because I don't know what to do with my hands, so I can just <laughs> do this. <laughs> the Dirt Academy was born because I started freaking out at how exciting it was to see my friends and then it turned into my clients experiencing the joy of growing food. It's more than just that one moment experience. It's such a connection to our heritage to be a little bit more connected to the food that nourishes us that it can be for everyone. It can be in a $1 pot on a balcony. It can be in the patch of dirt in your backyard. It can be in this like mega garden that we have. Wow, look at that. Great. Experiencing gardening and investing the time is for so much more than feeding Brendan and I. Like, we can't eat all the food that I grow. We can't can it fast enough. We can't stir fry it fast enough. It's mostly for the joy of sharing. So what I'm doing right now is very technical. Some would call it removing weeds. The more you pick, the less you have to pull. So I try to pick as many as possible so I don't have to pull as many. I have no idea what that means. I don't either. <laughs> They're synonymous. Six of one, half dozen of another. Six of one, half dozen of another. What does that mean? <laughs> it means I just same think it's thing. funny when you could say same or six of one, half dozen of another. <laughs> Our heritage is this farming way of life uh, for all of us. Like we all know, at least a few generations back, how we're connected to the land and we're not that far off. All we need is to like wake up that instinct in us to say, oh, I can totally do this. There's plenty of resources now. We're so connected. Um, there's lots of teachers to learn from. I'm constantly learning from the people that I follow that are in my circle, that are also growing in the same neighborhood as I am. I think the more people that make gardening and teaching gardening their job, the better. Just like victory gardens. During World War II, all the resources were going overseas. 
to just support our troops. And so people started growing victory gardens to just help the supply chain, like to help people eat. It was functional, just keeping people eating, but also I think gave people, like there's so much in the world we can't control. So we gotta release what we can't control, but growing our own food gives us a sense of like responsibility, gives us a sense of accomplishment. Yeah. Like we're doing something for our well-being and for our communities and families. Yeah. I mean, do you remember the, I think March 15th, when the world started shutting down before quarantine? When I called you from Publix, I was like, there's no food. Yeah. I had gone first thing in the morning and there was nothing on the shelves. But our garden was in full swing. So. Yeah wasn't as scary of an experience for us in the uncertainty of the world because we knew we'd have fresh produce for months and months. Everybody was like, hey, uh, can I buy some of your eggs? Yeah. Like, we'd love to have enough eggs for everybody. Uh, some friends that needed, that needed food. I'd put food in the mailbox and they'd come pick it up. The better we become, at giving it away, I think the more successful we're gonna be as communities of people. We grow what we eat, we eat it all together, and then we share it with the people that we love. That sharing is something that I try to keep in mind throughout the season. Like when people come here to our farm and walk through our garden, I'm always like, here, try this, here, try this, here, try this. Have you ever eaten lemon balm? Oh, it does taste like lemon. Yeah. Have you ever eaten a calamondine orange? Calamondin? They taste like, what's that sour candy? Airheads? Are they sour? Anyway, they taste like super, super sour candy. Nice and juicy. Oh yeah. Wow. The intensity of flavors in nature are so exciting to me because Everybody knows what a Sour Patch Kid tastes like, and you know when you put it close to your mouth, your mouth waters? Yeah. That exists in nature. Um, you don't really need to eat candy. There's like an exact little orange packet of that sour flavor, um, full of vitamin C, really, really good for you. So sharing that little explosion of flavor with people is the goal. If more people knew how simple it was to grow some of these crops, maybe they would try it and what can I do with my time to start inspiring that? Oh, hey. You might be wondering, why is he wearing an Ohio shirt? But this is actually the outline of my perspiration. I was actually raised in Ohio though, so love you, Ohio. So, we have coconut palms back there, and I saved some of the coconuts, and all of the ones here that I planted have not sprouted. You're supposed to take them and then soak them in water for a couple days. So I did that, planted them. We have this drip line irrigation, nothing. However, this I found on the beach that had already sprouted, so it had soaked in the ocean and came short. So it's actually doing really well. And this one I also found on the beach. So I got some, uh, Old baby coconut palm trees. But I'm out here because Nina um, is cooking dinner and she needs some peppers. So here we are, fresh peppers. Also, when you grow organic, sometimes you get lovely stuff like that. It's not all glitz and glam, people, but it's still good nutrition. This one I can't blame on being organic. We just didn't pick this soon enough. So let's go on to the chickens. never been accused of being a baseball player. In the way that gardening is for the thrifty, I love extending that even more into the rest of the season by making salsa, making pickles, making jams. I'm not always successful. <laughs> Little disclaimer, the first time we made tomato sauce, Brendan and I made the most monstrous batch you've ever seen. And it all went bad. 
It takes some time, it takes some practice to be able to use this method to extend the season in the garden, but it's worth it once you figure it out. We're gonna do salsa, Shirley family salsa. The most important steps in the beginning are to have a clean kitchen, that's the best way to start, and to get all of the supplies out. The few basic canning tools are really helpful. This is a magnet on a stick. It helps reach into the hot water for anything that's metal, and that way you're not trying to use your tongs, which are easier for other things. Last but not least, my cell phone, so that I can call my mother-in-law. Before I can every year, <laughs> I call my mother-in-law, Marianne, because I get nervous that I'm gonna mess it up, because I have messed it up majorly. Hello? Hello. Okay, I have the recipe in front of me, so I know the ingredients, but can you talk me through again so I can remember just the process of it? Aha! Uh -huh. Oh my gosh, look who just got here. Hey. Hey, I'm not interrupting anything, am I? Oh, no, no, no. And so there's a couple of methods for canning. One is a boiling water canning. And that's where you cover the jars, but you have to have the right kind of canner that has um, a metal piece in there to keep the jars from putting the bottom of it because uh, they can explode. How do you know that? Hmm, weird. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be terrible if somebody did it that way. Hmm. <laughs> I go put the baby to bed and all the salsa explodes. <laughs> okay, this recipe makes three or four of these pint jars, depending on how thick you want your salsa. If you boil it down more, it's only gonna make three. That's kind of how I like it. You need to work quickly while it's hot. It's easier with two people. Right, you think you have an extra hand while we... <laughs> I don't think that's gonna work very well. I recruited my mom. <laughs> she was here this morning, hanging out with us in River, then went home, and I was like, actually, mom, can you <laughs> come help me make the salsa? It sounded more like, no. Oh. <laughs> Have you made this salsa before? I've never made salsa before. Okay. So yay, okay. I get to learn. So first you're gonna take four cups of tomatoes and boil them until the skin cracks, peel them in the sink, and then chop them up. Then you're gonna get out your food processor or use your good old fashioned hands and a knife and chop up the rest of these veggies. One cup chopped onions, two cups chopped green peppers, two cups chopped red peppers, those are the sweet bell peppers, and then your jalapenos, totally depends on how hot you want it. Maybe one cup, maybe two cups. That's kind of the range. Unless you're a crazy person, you want a lot more than that. Two cloves of garlic minced up really small. Three quarter cups apple cider vinegar. One tablespoon of sugar. One tablespoon of salt. One teaspoon of paprika. Maybe that's the secret ingredient one teaspoon dried oregano. Put all that in, stir it up really good, and boil all that for about an hour. Stir it, make sure nothing's sticking to the bottom of your pan. Keep the lid off. See, I don't even have a lid out so that I don't mess this part up. Um, we want that water to evaporate off of the salsa so that it gets a little bit thicker. You can only do this method if you have boiled the ingredients for a long time because that gets rid of the molds and spores and bacteria, anything that might be harmful. When you're done with that, add in the can of tomato paste and your chopped up fresh cilantro, about a quarter cup of that. Take a, a pan and put, oh, maybe four or five inches of water in it and bring it to a boil, and then you roll the jar in that hot water. And because the salsa is really hot, you can pour that right into the jar. So you do a jar, set it over there, stick another one in so it can start getting hot yep. while you're filling the other jar so they don't cool off before you fill them. You need to fill it up to about a quarter of an inch from the top. Then you wipe off the top of the jar because if there's anything any juice or any salsa pieces left on the edge of the jar, it won't seal. Then you take the boiling lid and the boiled ring, tighten the lid, and then you turn it upside down on the counter and just leave it. Don't touch it again until it's completely cooled off. And then a day later, you can pick up your jars and check. Have you ever done the little pop test? This jar is not sealed because the air is coming in and out. And you can hear the popping of this lid. As soon as this is sealed, this is gonna pop down. And that way, you know when you have to flick off the lid of something, that's how you know it's sealed when you go to eat it in a month or two or three or 12. When do you add all the preservatives? There are no preservatives in it. Oh, 
Um, okay. You know what, Brendan? You know what, Brendan? What? Now that you know how to make it, you can do it, right? Woo! Kind of fuzzy on it, so <laughs> better take care of it. Uh-huh. How about I grow the veggies, you make the salsa. Hey. There you go. Thanks for walking us through it. You're welcome. Thanks, Mama. Okay. Bye. We love See you. you. Love you. Bye. Love you. Bye. So ever since we brought that tree inside, we've periodically heard uh, That's pretty accurate, right? A frog noise coming from the tree. We haven't heard it the last couple of days. I was just in the nursery, and I was like, what is that green thing? Everything's under control. So milkweed is a super cool little plant to have around here. I used to keep a bunch of pots in our porch to grow different types of milkweed. The caterpillars would eat the milkweed plants that I was growing and hang their chrysalis. Oh, look at this. This butterfly is pumping the fluid from its body into its wings. And then I came over to the cow pasture this time of year and it's full of milkweed because the cows don't eat it. It's like, oh, glad I've been spending so much time on these little struggling milkweed plants on my porch when the pasture is full of it. Because, oh, hey, B, ah, look. Oh. <laughs> An open gate is a dangerous thing. <laughs> The cows eat around this in the pasture because it's toxic to most other animals. Most monarch populations migrate down south for the winter, but in South Florida, a lot of the monarchs are able to stay here year round. So that's special to have them on the farm um, all the time. The first few flowers on any given plant, whether it's cucumbers or tomatoes, might not end up turning into food just because it takes pollinators a second to find the plant. So don't panic if the first few squash flowers or tomato flowers don't ripen all the way. But as your plants get bigger and stronger, the pollinators will find so flowers. Like honeybees are the main pollinators, right? Yes. So can we get bees? No pressure, asking Speaking me on camera. Bees. So it would make the most sense if we build a garden like what we have to use as many square inches to grow the most food possible, but I plant a ton of flowers on the corner of every single bed. Sometimes I use an entire bed just to grow flowers, and I'm trying to grow things that attract different pollinators so that throughout the season, it's attracting to the butterflies, the bees, the, the moths at night. I want every type of pollinator in the garden. The idea that we would invest space for flowers might not make sense, except that bees make the world go round, basically. So another closed loop that we can have on the farm is our pollinators. We need a horse so I can go on long rides to celebrate life. <laughs> this is Jupiter Farms. There's horses uh, walking past. I think we should maybe start with boarding a horse. That's what I mean. So we get paid for having a horse. Love it. Let's do it. My whole life, I've been in love with horses. I love riding. I love taking care of them. My cousin has them on a farm in Georgia. My not-so-secret dream is to live inside the TV show Heartland. If you know me, you know that. <laughs> Adding more animals to the farm is the goal, but we have a lot to learn. Our neighbors like Quinn and her daughter Caroline know so much about every single animal that I dream of having. And I get to pick their brains all the time about goats and ducks and sheep and horses and their rescue donkeys. Oh, look at those ears. So good. The order in which we're going to add to what we have as far as plants and livestock is not, oh, I think donkeys are so cute, which I do. And I totally want mini donkeys or a mule. My actual heart is to add things that are going to take care of the land and take care of what we already have. Brendan would be proud. I'm dreaming up here all the time about the things that we're gonna add, but he thinks more about like function and what is going to make the most sense and help us take care of what we already have. So, babe, that one's for you. 
When I met Caroline, she was riding bareback in her backyard with her hair flowing. I was like, who is this girl? She's incredible. And I have a feeling River's gonna grow up with that exact freedom and confidence and passion. What's going on? Let's try to feed them every couple days, give them some goodies, keep them happy. Instead of eating grass all the time. Here they come. <laughs> I'm a contractor and never thought we'd have a piece of land like this and cows and chickens and and really fun, you know. This one's the friendliest of all. Oh, your tongue! Gross! <laughs> the dream that we've had, that I've been describing for years and years, is to have a place that feels less like my farm or my property, and that feels more like a community space that our people love. At first, we could really barely ask people to come over because there was fire ants everywhere, there was flooding that was kind of coming on from the cow pasture. The barn was basically condemned and we were trying to renovate it, but it was a mess and just things were falling apart, I feel like, more than they were coming together. The other night we were in the kitchen and I had a flash of, wow, this is exactly my intention and our vision for the space because uh, Brendan and I were cooking food and some of my family was in the kitchen and I looked out at the garden and uh, Ellie and Santi were making a salad for dinner and then I could see over to the barn in the pool and one of my friends, Kyla, was here with all her little girls and they were swimming and laughing and playing. Uh, my dad was out feeding treats to the cows for an hour and a half. The whole farm was just covered in people enjoying their day. Just in the moment, present, smiling, thankful, um, just feeling the sun and enjoying the space. That is the dream that I've seen over the last couple years. Our people experience this <laughs> feeling of freedom that you can kind of find when you have this much open space to be creative and use your imagination. I feel like I've been places where it seems like it's set up for guests, but it really not. <laughs> like they really, like it, like it just looks right. It looks magazine ready or something, but they don't actually want humans there. One wonderful thing about what Brendan and Nina have done is they do want humans there and they don't mind messy humans. And they understand that that's what relationships are like. You don't have a pristine existence. You've got organic beings there. You've got not only livestock, but you've got actual relationships that can be messy. It's that, it's that mentality of not only does it look like you're welcome here, but you are welcome. Being on the road, traveling on a bus, it was almost like community was built in. Now living on a farm, we have to be more intentional to like, cultivate that community. Being an introvert, I need to get out of my little comfortable zone. And Nina being an extrovert helps me with that. Maybe I help you learn how to get some solitude once in a while? Oh, for sure. So the intentionality on both our parts to like invite each other in, invite people in, is really important. I hope that over time, having friends here to help plant seeds and help plant transplants, put flowers in pots, just like get their hands dirty with the work of the land, and then also come back and eat meals of the food that we're growing is inspiring. There's been so many generous people in my story up to this point that have taken time to teach me 
and show me what healthy community and growing healthy produce and healthy animals requires. And so if I can be a small part of that journey for somebody else, then ah, I'm good with that. So, I always start with so, 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 so. I just want to say to all of my 14 million Instagram followers that you should watch the Dirt Academy. Is that what this is called? <laughs> it's not. There, that's a part of... He's aiming for something to jump on. And then jump on to my face. Get off my camera.